Correction officers, have you ever met an inmate that was actually a very nice person but did absolutely horrifying crimes? If so, what's their story? I was a federal parolee counselor working in a halfway house reacclimation program. Most of my clients were capital offenders coming out of 20 plus prison stints. Most of the clients were actually great people at face value. Outside of legal distribution, which most of my clients were in prison for, I had people who committed all the crimes you can think of, as well as some pretty notorious biker gang guys, who all have committed some heinous crimes but usually get busted for a sloth of less violent things. Indiana biker gangs, for example, were big on rolling casinos and auto theft. That's what they'd get slammed for. Rolling casinos are basically mini casinos packed into the box trailers of semi-trucks and they set up makeshift casinos and gambling houses. Oftentimes, they are in conjunction with used car lots, where they also sell stolen cars or motorcycles too, and they'll set up shop for a night or two and then move on to the next place. I've had multiple clients explain them to me. They've always called them rolling casinos, very illegal in and of itself, but they are also nefariously ran and will rob big winners. I gotta say that I don't remember having a single client who wasn't a nice person. It's easy to read their files and go, holy crap, this guy's demented as hell, but you learn to desensitize to that and do your job at reacclimating them back into society. I did have one guy who was serving 18 years of his 25-year sentence. He was on lithium, chlorpromazine, and benzotropine. Very strange guy, feeble, soft-spoken, very small frame, probably around 65 years old and genuinely kind. That is until one day when he refused his meds for some goddamn reason. It wasn't readily known how long he'd been off of them. IIRC, we found a week's worth stash in his bed that he'd chewed and spit out later, amongst some other mostly harmless contraband. Once they left our facility, we never got updates or reports unless we ran into a PO or someone who was involved. At no point did I really feel threatened by his outburst. It was kind of surreal. Like his eyes and words were lifeless. When he hurt himself, dude didn't even flinch. They had to replace the flooring in that office from all the red. I kind of think he whizzed himself too, but maybe I'm imagining that. I've tried my damnedest to remember his name to see if I could search for him online, but have no clue. If I saw him on the street though, I'd recognize him instantly. What sucks about federally contracted parolee counselors is that we're supposed to be 12 clients to one counselor, and I'd have 35 to 40 clients at a time. So approving work, subsistence, education, furloughs, or even moving them to ankle-monitored living at an approved home was vastly rushed simply trying to keep up with everyone. Happened all the time that I'd approve a furlough for someone, their family would fly in to visit, and the system would be three to four days behind. So the client would be set to go, I'd assume all was good, only to find out their furlough never made it through the superintendent for final approval. Talked about pissed off parolees, lol. So anyway, he walked right into my office on a scheduled education verification check and went berserk, flipped my desk, hurt himself, threatened my whole family, and ended up laying on the ground trying to chew the wood leg of my desk. This all happened in about 20 seconds or so before we could restrain him and call the police. I'd never seen such a blatant portrayal of a mental health issue in my life. Still messes me up to this day. I have a lot of random stories about my clients, but most are positive and most of those guys were easy to get along with and great people if you didn't know their history. I've seen a lot of hardened, grown men break down in tears out of fear of going outside and trying to go back to prison. They usually have a specific time frame to get employment as well, and it can be extremely tough to watch these guys get rejected by employers to the point that the parole officer puts them back in prison. I've spent many days on my knees begging McDonald managers or Goodwill managers to please hire certain clients. Well, he got seven years of his sentence paroled. Pretty sure that outburst revoked his parole, but I can't say for sure. And yeah, I've had a lot of dealers from the 80s, early 90s. One of the most interesting people I've ever met was a dealer from Louisville, Kentucky. Got busted with 27 kilos of illegal substances and $790,000 of cash under his bed. Rumor was, when they busted him, 80% of Louisville's snow got removed from the market. This guy was about as close to being a real gangster as I've ever seen. This freaking dude got out of prison and had a job washing cars at a car dealership the first day he was allowed to search for employment. He claimed he was making $7.25 an hour, showing 30 hours a week of work, so his subsistence was 25% of his income. 
As we were backed up quite a bit, it took me about six to seven days to do an unannounced employment verification check. Now, this isn't one of your small car dealers either. It's a big chain of three really nice car dealerships. So I pop in one day and ask to speak to him. This lady looked at me funny and walked me back to this giant office. So I sat down and she went and got him. The moment he walked in wearing a goddamn suit, I knew something was up. He sat behind the desk and basically spilled everything. Dude freaking owned the dealership, all three of them. His family had invested his money for him while he was locked up for some 25 odd years. Was literally a millionaire. We sat there for about two hours as he explained everything and that he couldn't officially take over the business until he was off of parole. He must have been about 50 years old or so, insanely interesting guy, very cool dude, a bit suave I guess. I was just floored by him. Rarely a day goes by where he doesn't pop up in my mind. I ended up not saying anything to his parole officer nor did I document any of that conversation. He would have gone back to prison if I reported him. I always use him as an example of what a real gangster is like, not those freaking idiot state offenders who act tough because they think it's cool. Those guys are just wannabe idiots. This guy was a goddamn gangster and for some reason, I had a lot of admiration for him. Holy crap, that was frightening to even read, but even more so interesting. Story 2 I worked in a small prison in Germany. Now and then, when the other prisons in the area were over capacity, we'd get the odd weekend guest. Mostly cruel spouses who were locked up for a few days, so their SO had the chance to pack a few bags in peace to get away. Drunks who had gone on a rampage, that kind of thing. I worked there for 8 years and during that time there was one guy who was a recurring guest. He was in his late 50s, always well dressed, very, very friendly, educated, extremely compliant with our rules, quiet, basically the kind of inmate you want if you work in a place like this. As a woman, I never had much to do with him, but my colleagues always reported that the guy was almost a joy to meet and work with. He was a stalker. The object of his obsession was a woman from his small town neighborhood. He'd relentlessly terrorized her for the better part of 10 years starting when she was in her late teens. Thousands of phone calls, letters, attempts to get into her parents' house and apartment, not sure which it was, following her on the streets. The stalker laws, when it started, basically said that as long as he didn't do anything to her physically, there was nothing that could be done. I have no idea why the family didn't move away from that town to protect her. The times he was locked up, it was for attempts of breaking and entering. He ended up ending her. Story 3 I had someone that was to have surgery on his middle finger. It had been broken three or four weeks prior, fighting in jail, so it was partially healed. He was cold and distant, didn't say much, but I could tell he was scared to be put to sleep. I tried to comfort him. When they started to sedate him, he started to cry, just tears running down his face. I held his non-broken hand and wiped his tears away. Once he was completely out, the surgeon pretty much cussed me out for being too kind to this kid, really embarrassed me told me that he was a ruthless criminal, that he and his friend had robbed the home of one of his fellow surgeons, tied up the surgeon and his wife. I immediately felt even more sorry for the kid. He was 14 when the crime happened, just a stupid freaking kid, and ended up taking the life of a wife and mother. Now he was alone and destined for life in prison, trying to be hard but scared as hell to be in surgery. He should be with his mom, getting kissed before rolling back, but he was shackled up until he was 100% knocked out from anesthesia. I wouldn't have treated him any different if I had known his crime. That's what makes me a good nurse and him a crappy surgeon. Give the case to someone else if you can't handle the emotion. This surgeon I'm speaking of is a total piece of crap. I've seen him close up hips that are obviously not properly set, on old women like people's grandmas, then when the post-op x-ray shows this mistake, he blames it on the staff that transported that patient after surgery. He only hugs pretty women, and not in a normal way, he holds them at the hips to hug them. I'm one of the attractive nurses who hides when I see him coming down the hall, just to avoid that disgusting hug. He's known for cheating on his wife. He's old and needs to quit, but one of his mistresses sued him 15 years ago, and he lost a lot of money, so he's still working. He's also been sued for malpractice. He's a complete jerk. He wears cowboy boots with black scrubs that are three sizes too small. Story 4 
I work as a school resource officer at a high school during the school year and a patrol officer when school is out, summer, Christmas, spring, etc. One of the kids I had to deal with a lot was a real smart kid, got good grades, and a nice guy, but he just couldn't stay out of trouble. Just small stuff, stealing from a few stores, drinking, got into a small fight, but overall, he was a good guy. Well, one summer I got a call for a domestic at this guy's house. Nothing unusual, his parents always fought. When I got there though, John, not his real name, was outside, kneeling down, hands on his head, covered in red. I tried talking to him, but he wouldn't say a word. Backup arrived, and I went into the house with my sergeant and saw the dad on his back, and his face was just unrecognizable. He was hitting the mom and the kid just had enough of it and took matters into his own hands. Now this one makes me sad. Someone else's problem becoming a larger one for others. On a lighter note, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more stories. I know some of these stories are tough to hear, but sometimes they're also cathartic. So let's go ahead and get back to the video and thank you for watching so far. Story 5 Former prisoners here, generally the guys are just trying to get through their time with as little hassle as possible and tend to be polite or respectful. Maybe that's more towards the nurses because we take care of their health when they're sick or injured or because we hand out good stuff. I can't tell you how many times I've had jokes about me being the dealer on the range. I generally never asked about what my inmates were in for, I just offered mutual respect and kept what promises I could make. Some of the nicest inmates I had were Hell's Angels and Gangbangers, the worst were the Junkies. There's an ongoing inmate narcissism with them that wears on caregivers heavily. The nicest inmate I ever had was this super sweet old Chinese guy who didn't speak much English but looked like a Hu from Whoville. He always smiled and waved, was ultra polite and made jokes, turns out he was a gang boss and in for some major charges. The other nicest inmate was a high-profile gang leader who started having idiopathic seizures. Dude was 6 foot 6 and over 300 pounds. One day, he wasn't feeling well and I knew he was probably going to seize again, so I asked my CEOs to bring him to the clinic. I met them halfway at the elevators and before we could get on, my inmate starts swaying and humming. I asked the guards to get under his arms and lower him. They weren't too keen. Don't worry, he'll bounce off the concrete. So without thinking, I grabbed the guy as he collapsed on top of me and I lowered us both down. At this point, I'm stuck underneath a guy with his head on my lap facing outwards. Seizure is over and I'm nervous he's going to wake up and lash out, so I started stroking his head and singing Soft Kitty until he came back. Finally, someone showed up with a wheelchair and I transferred him out to the ER. A few days later, I'm back on his unit and he's waving hello to me from across the range as I'm heatedly arguing with a junkie who's trying to convince me he takes a lot of oxycodone, but can't prove it with a medical script. Junkie walks away, and before I know it, the seizure inmate is having a chat with him as I'm working with another inmate. Once I'm done, the junkie sheepishly comes back to me, apologizes, and is on his way. Seizure inmate, the big gang-banging gun-running dealing assault with a deadly weapon soft kitty that he strolls up to me and lets me know that he's made sure that everyone on his range and beyond will continue to show me the respect I deserve. I gave that man a cookie. Story 6 Not a CEO, but I was an inmate for a brief period of time. There was a lady a few cells down from me who was the sweetest, most generous, nurturing lady in our pod. She was always making sure people had enough to eat. She would share her warm clothes with girls who didn't get commissary money. And if anyone ever looked upset, she was the first to go up and offer comfort. Turns out she was in there for severe child neglect. There was another girl who was always extremely bubbly, always making jokes and laughing, friends with everyone. She was a brilliant artist and very religious. In addition to going to every church and prayer service that was offered, she would even lead her own Bible study groups in our pod. I didn't find this out until she was transported to the state penitentiary, but apparently she was serving a 12-year sentence for roughing up some guy during an armed robbery. It was really horrific. The guy was in a coma for months and ended up suffering permanent brain damage. It was honestly really hard for me to process these things. I'd gotten fairly close to both of these women over the course of my time in there. Not that this excuses anything, but both of them had pretty messed up childhoods. Sometimes good people really do terrible things and don't even seem to understand their own actions. I'm a firm believer that the root of our crime problem is a mental health problem. Story 7 Former female CEO at an all-male prison, my pod was mostly made up of people who had to be kept separate, 
and the rest were the more mentally disturbed that had to be taking medication several times a time. My inmates were a lot of old men, really nice, just like any other old man you'd meet on the street. One guy was so friendly and kind, he was even a pastor from my hometown. Obviously, I knew he did something bad to get put in there, but he was so nice to me, it was like a gut punch when I heard his charges. Another old man in my pod was quite friendly as well. I felt there was something a little off about him, but hey, he's pretty old. Seemed harmless enough, but he wasn't. You can see a pattern here. This one guy, he wasn't particularly nice. He always creeped me the heck out, and you could just tell he was in for that type of crime. He did something far worse than I thought, though. Those poor EMTs, I couldn't look at that guy again. It was hard to treat him or any of them like humans anymore. Less disturbing but still more violent than expected, this one guy was really funny and really nice. He was a hoot. He ended a couple of random people in a Burger King with an axe because they were annoying him. As proof that these inmates can be charming and manipulative as hell, he knocked up a former CO, which got her sent to prison. It was consensual, but she was in a position of power. They teach you in training about how manipulative they can be, and everyone always talks about dumb you've got to be to fall for it. Then they do, and they didn't even realize. You have to be very strong-willed for this job. It's not easy being around these people. It changes you. I was never very trusting, but I sure as hell am less so now. I'm much more alert about my surroundings now, but also more fearless. I feel safer having worked that job honestly because of the self-defense you're taught. I loved it, and I'd still be there if I hadn't gotten injured and disabled in an unrelated accident. Even so, I do not recommend this job to just anyone. Story 8. Haven't been a CEO for almost two years, but I'll never forget one guy we had in jail for. He had ended an entire family after robbing the house. Dude was 6'7 and about 330 pounds of pure muscle. He wasn't just the biggest guy in his pod, he was the biggest guy in the jail. I remember when he first came into the jail, we were warned that he was unstable and to stay on our toes, and I eventually had to work the pod and I treated him like I did all inmates. My mentality has always been to treat inmates like adults and talk to them like I would a normal person, and that actually saved me a few times. So I was working in the pod and noticed when I would ask him to do something, he would just kind of look at me funny and I would go back to doing what I originally was doing. After working in there a few times, I didn't have to ask anyone to do anything when I walked in. He would tell the whole pod, Hey y'all, it's Captain Texaco. Y'all know how he likes things done, so let's do it so he can get through the day and get home. I eventually asked him why he did that, and he told me ever since he came to jail, everyone has been scared of him, and either would be too scared to say anything, or would talk down to him like he was stupid. And I was the only one that talked to him like a human being, and since he will never get out, it's the least he could do as thanks. Story 9. Currently a CO, I'd say most of the inmates I come in frequent contact with, the porters on my companies, yard porters, industry workers, are usually seemingly okay individuals. I would occasionally ask a con what they were in for, just out of curiosity. Some dudes told me straight, some told BS stories, others just went deadpan and ignored the question. Either way, as a CO, you have to look at the bigger picture. These dudes aren't in prison for being class A citizens, and they may turn around and try and end you given the chance, but most dudes really do just want to do their time. Story 10. My dad is currently an investigator in a prison and licensed to perform polygraphs. Before working in the prison, one of the jobs he had was to interview candidates who applied to work for the state patrol while performing a polygraph. They had to pass the polygraph in order to go on to the state patrol academy. He's really good at what he does and very personable. Eventually, he ended up getting burnt out emotionally from it and took a different job. Some of these applicants who looked really good on paper and on the surface level would end up confessing to him that they had done some really awful things in their past. It's crazy to think that if they hadn't done the polygraph interviews on these people that they would never come to find out those things and might have actually become state troopers. It's chilling, really. Story 11 First week as a CO, my FTO tells me to do a cell check on an empty cell, direct supervision facility so the inmates were out in the day room and the cell was near our desk. I did the check and came back to report there were cartoons drawn on the walls with a pencil. Really well drawn too. So my FTO calls the inmate over and tells him to wipe all the cartoons off the walls. 
tells me to stand outside the cell and watch him to make sure he wipes them all off. While cleaning the walls, the inmate and I have an in-depth discussion about how he likes creating characters and is an avid comic reader. We swap stories about favorite comics and I update him. He's been in for a while about current changes to X-Men and some other series. He finishes cleaning up the walls and I report back to my FTO. Naturally curious, I ask what he's in for. Apparently, he had pulled a weapon on his mom, ended her, and then called the police on himself. Super nice dude, though. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you're also going to enjoy Police Officers, What's the Most Heartbreaking Thing a Criminal Has Said? Story 2 was super sad.